guys, I'm Danny, and thanks for tuning in to The Grown Up Hustle. This podcast is based on real people sharing all their different journeys as they navigate this crazy ride called adulting. From coffee o'clock to wine o'clock and all that happens in between, we're here to openly discuss how we're all just really hustling our way through life. So if you're ready for the highs, the lows, and a whole lot of real talk, then stay tuned because we've got you covered. Hello, hello. I am finally back. It has definitely been a hot minute. I was only supposed to have a short break. It ended up turning into a much longer break. I was waiting on having some surgery, nothing major, uh, but it got put off. So I thought, well, now's as good a time as any. No more excuses. Let's get this shit rolling. So I am officially back with season two. How are you all keeping? Thank you for tuning in again today. I have definitely missed you guys. Hope you feel the same way. Um, I have had several emails uh, asking when season two was going to be dropping. So for all of those people who did reach out and drop me a message asking where I am at and when I am launching season two, thank you. You gave me the kick up the ass that I definitely needed. So what's been happening for the past couple of months in my world? I built the website or I finished building the website for Grown Up Hustle, which is grownuphustle.com. Very basic, just has the podcast shows on it and a little bit of show info. But I am hoping to develop that over the next six to 12 months. So watch this space. I've also been heaps busy with my production and editing work for other people's shows. Um, One of my shows that I produce went straight into Apple's top 10 and has been sat there for the past two months. So I've been nursing that like an actual baby. Um, But yeah, just busy, busy on my end. Nice to see that the UK is finally starting to return to some semblance of normality so it's been great catching up with friends having nights out going out for dinner drinks I have been loving it because I did think that I was going to go crazy this past year and a half so season two what have we got in store for you for season two uh season one was a lot of life stories how people have been met with struggles in their life and how they use mindset and self-empowerment to overcome these obstacles season two is going to see a lot more on on self-empowerment, mindset hacks, tips and tricks, different challenges that we face on the daily every single day and just kind of how to overcome them. Um, There's going to be guest spots and speakers. There'll be a couple of solo shows, I think. And yeah, I'm just going to see how things play out. Starting season two off slightly different. So for anyone that listened to season one, I've got Louise Johnson back on the show, author of the book Lou Who. Uh, Lou and I have formed a friendship over the time that we connected and Lou is launching a new website and the first piece that she's writing on the website is about societal milestones uh, reaching a certain age in your life and wondering if if you're happy if you're hitting those milestones and as a married woman of 37 with no children she reached out to me on that topic and I said to her okay that's fine can we record this because I feel like there would be content that we could make a potential show out of it so Like I said, very different. It's more of a very open and honest chat between two friends, but I've recorded it so you guys can take a little listen. Definitely let me know what your thoughts are and give me a bit of feedback because it is different to my other shows. Um, And yeah, I hope you enjoy. So with that in mind, I guess let's get started. So what are we talking about? Like, okay, so I am decided that I just don't have enough on my plate. And so, but actually I also just really, I really want to write more. So I just wanted to be like, okay, what do I want to write? And it's not just these dating stories anymore. And so, but the new blog is really much more just about holistic relationships. So relationships with ourselves, with friends, family, romantic dating, sex, all that kind of stuff. So still some of the stuff that would have been in divorce and dating, but a lot more, yeah, more like around like the human experience in general. So then I can talk about more mental health stuff, like more of the stuff that was in the book. The stories are not the same anymore, even from the dating perspective. The way they were going to put like position on the website is actually when you go, there will still be the whole divorce and dating at 30 section. 
And so I'm going to kind of have a preface there that says like, this was me early thirties, like drinking heavily, seeing a lot of different men that was kind of then. And then this is me kind of now in the new blog post. So I just felt like it was a very apt opportunity to then also go out with a article about aging and kind of just how I feel around that. So that was my thought. And then and I was thinking about it and I've really had to like reframe in my head, taking stock of life when, when it's your birthday. And at least I do all the time every year. It's like, okay, it's my birthday. Like, what have I done in the last year? Like, where are we at? Like, it's just the number thing. I'm like, why am I so bothered by this? And so, yeah, for me, I always take stock every year at my birthday. And, you know, what is the default to go to is, you know, like married, career, kids, like those life milestones that we know so well that are kind of like always the societal out. life milestones. You <laughs> yeah. Mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. I know yeah. those ones. Yeah, you right. know, and so, and so obviously, you know, I'm not taking so many of those boxes, but I'm taking so many other boxes. And so I think for me, that's like, has been a real work, especially as like the number I've been really comfortable with the numbers so far, but like 37 just feels like, what's a little close to 40. You know what I mean? Like it's you, just... you're ticking all of what I would call the modern woman life boxes. Yes. So you're not ticking the standard societal milestones that they they have kind of tried to deeply ingrain in us from you know childhood you you've kind of been there and done some of those things as well Lou and you know what they weren't that great so (laughs) moving on to the new the new sort of like way of life I think you're doing really well like you're nailing it yeah yeah and I think that's it it's the traditional milestones which don't really have a place for everyone right like they do for some people and absolutely I for those people that it makes sense for that's great but the reality is yeah for me it's just been you know that hasn't been like you say I was I was kind of I was almost if you'd taken stock at like 25 I was like really on on track with those and so but now it's like okay well that's not where we're at so I think it's just that reframing so in terms of that taking stock I think that for me it has just been reframing it in my head and like making making it make sense for me but then I was wondering if for other people especially women so you know I'm, I'm like I said I'm struggling a little bit with 37 and I I hate I kind of hate it I do hate it because I shouldn't be it's aging is such a privilege and I'm so aware of that like not everybody gets to do it getting to 37 is so wonderful and there's so much more of my life ahead of me hopefully you know I'm trying not to be down on it but there's definitely feelings that come up and emotions that come up and so in my head I was wondering like does that does the same come up for other women depending on their life situation and and those milestone boxes that they're taking traditional or otherwise and so I wanted to speak to other people and you were someone that kind of came up in my head of someone to chat to just to get like a different perspective on it in terms of you know you're married um, but no kids and and understanding and, and I you know we'll talk to like others other friends of mine as well who are married kids career and so taking all those traditional boxes and I'm like so do you care do, are you just like yeah of course I'm happy getting older because I'm I'm you know I'm like doing life right as society tells me does that make it easier my guess is it doesn't my guess is that though that's how ridiculous those boxes are is that they make not any bit of difference because what they don't talk to is happiness or fulfillment or alignment or on the opposite side, stress levels, or, you know, any of those things. So I think that's kind of what I'm trying to sort of uncover and just like get little, little anecdotes from others in terms of their feelings on aging. For me, where it all sits. So obviously I'm married, been married the past couple of years. Um, I never really actually wanted to get married. So it sounds quite strange. If I hadn't married my husband, I probably wouldn't have gotten married. Like I married my husband because I've known him for so many years So I felt like I actually knew who I was marrying. I mean, (laughs) again, I know my audience right now, so maybe not. But I felt like it was a bit more of a a, a sort of safe bet. I probably wouldn't have bothered getting married had I met someone different and it wasn't my husband who who I was with, you know, my now husband who I was with. I never, ever wanted children, ever. And when I was about, to be honest, when I was about 16, that's when I started having some like fertility issues and I was back and forth to the gyno. And a lot of people said, oh, these are the, the you know, the famous quotes. You'll change your mind when you get older. OK, so I, I kept accepting that because, you know, obviously everybody else knows what I want so much more than myself. So you'll change your mind when you get older. And the other thing was, oh, well, maybe you've trained your brain to feel that way because you are aware that you've got fertility problems. I don't agree. I feel like I want to agree because I feel that would make me a a more agreeable human and B, which generally I'm not, and 
B, it makes other people feel more comfortable because people don't understand why I don't have this burning desire to have a child, but I don't. And my husband, I had a conversation with my husband the other the other week and I said to him, do you feel like we're getting left behind because we don't have a child and pretty much nearly everyone around us has a child. I'm not saying everyone around us with a child is particularly happy or living their best life. But, you know, they have kids and they hang out with other people who have kids and we don't. My husband really does not like children. If we had one ourselves, I know he would be a lovely father, but you know other people's kids? He's just plight, but he doesn't want them really (laughs) around him or he's just like, oh, like I can't, like I just can't. Even to the point with his like um, nephews and nieces, his siblings, no, don't even bother. Like do not hand the baby to my husband or don't, you know, he, he, he doesn't want a bar of it. He's not interested. But I said to him, you know, do you feel like maybe we're getting left behind? And, you know, I'm concerned. So he can't have a baby on his own, obviously. (laughs) So he needs me to, to make that baby. And I the chances of me getting pregnant are very, very slim, but potentially if I tried IVF, maybe there would be a slim, slim hope for me. It doesn't sit comfortably. First of all, I don't want a baby that badly. Second of all, I kind of don't feel comfortable. I don't feel that that's what I want to put my body through and my mental health through as well. So it's just not that of a burning thing for me, but he said, you know, I love our life. I love our life as well, you know, and I said to him, I'm just so worried that you will regret it when, you know, we're older. And he was like, fuck no, like, why would I regret it when everyone else is battling with like pesky teenagers and we're in like our second home in the south of France? He's like, it's a different path, isn't it? He said, it's just a different path. And, you know, I look at our our life. We don't tick any traditional boxes by any stretch of the word. Yes, we're a married couple. I don't even feel like when I say like I'm a wife and a, like a missus, it's funny because in my head, I still feel like I'm about 18. So, you know, it hasn't changed the dynamic of our relationship by any stretch of the word. And we own a house, but do I think like that was another big life milestone to tick off? Do I think it's made any difference to our lives you know just you know got more bills to pay now haven't you and you you know you can't just do a bunk <laughs> within a month or whatever yeah. but no landlord to call <laughs> yeah and you know when when the roof leaks you got to pay to fix it yourself so <laughs> it's great but um but you know we've sort of gone through ticking off these boxes if you like but it hasn't made any difference to our lives and I look at how we both like to live and I would say both quite selfish people We both like our own space. You know, I love the fact, like me and my husband, we get up at different times. We go to bed at different times. He's a night person. I'm a morning person. It just, it kind of works for our world. Put a baby into the mix. I don't think it would work. And I would feel, this is going to sound probably very harsh, but I would feel probably resentful that a baby was taking my my time. And I'm not saying that everyone that has a baby, their partner isn't enough for them, but, but, you know, a lot of people do have children to fix a gap in their relationships. And a lot of people, when their children leave and go to uni, their marriages break down. And, you know, it's, it's, it is, it's a difficult one for other people to get their head around. Like my mum and dad say, we don't want grandkids. My mum said there was a stage, you know, maybe when you're in your twenties that I thought, oh, might be nice she's like I'm too old I'm too selfish and I love the dogs they're just they're enough you know and we'll we'll look after them but you know we don't we don't particularly want grandkids so that obviously alleviates a little bit of pressure off me so it's making that life choice that works best for us but then you take everyone else into consideration around you as in your social scene and all of a sudden there's a complete disconnect yeah and you feel that, and I've had this quite quite a lot, and obviously I, I am going to put this out there. So for any of my friends who've got children, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but it is how it is that they have a child and that's literally all they seem to talk about. And I get it. Your kid is great. Like it's beautiful and wonderful and it's yours and you made it. But how are you? Like yeah. you ring them up and you want to have a deep and meaningful conversation sometimes, or you just want to check in on, you know, what's going down in their world. And they'll tell you about their baby or their child. And great. Like, tell me about your little one for five minutes, but 
all of a sudden I feel like I'm losing my connections with my friends because we, we don't have any shared common interest because you want to talk about the child. I don't have a child to talk about. Yeah. And, and I felt quite sorry. Another friend of mine who's um, got fertility issues, she said to me, she went out with some other friends who, who had little ones and they were all talking about how amazing it was to be a mummy. And she said, I didn't feel like I could get involved in the conversation. Yeah. I'm not a mummy. She yeah. said, I suddenly thought, oh God, I don't have anything in common with them because I'm not a mummy. And she said, I just kind of felt like this strange spare part floating around the friendship group. And that's quite, you know, um, more so, you know, for her, my my heart went out to her. I don't care when people talk about pregnancy and babies and, and stuff yeah. because it's not, you know, yes, I've got the fertility problems, but no, I wouldn't say, it, you know, it's not of mass concern to me, but for women who are desperately trying to have a baby and they've tried everything, sometimes I want to say to the people who are in that baby bubble, guys, come on now. Like you need to step out of it and think about the other people around you. Well, and it's interesting because that, that baby bubble, I was thinking about this this morning, actually. And I was like, it kind of reminds me a little bit of like, it, it is a club, right? Like it, the mommy club. And, and, and I, and I mean that in the, the best sense of like, you, you have to have that shared camaraderie, I would imagine, because it sounds like such a stressful and, and challenging time. I'm like, so of course you want to like lean on other people for support that get it and have been there and are going through it and things. So, and, and it's similar to like in my head, I was like, oh, I guess, I was on a podcast a couple of weeks ago and we were talking about um, the divorce club. And I think that there's something to be said for that as well. Like it's very difficult for people to truly understand being divorced if they haven't been. And yes, breakups can be similar in the long term, like, but there's something different about there also being like legal issues attached to it and all those yeah. sort of other things. And so I was like, I mean, certainly the divorce club, no one necessarily plans or wants to be in there, which, you know, is slightly different from the mommy club, but it is one of those things that I think it's so difficult to explain and to understand if you aren't in it. And I think that's the the trouble with it is that, you know, unless you've been there and done it, then there is going to be a disconnect there. It's just a natural thing. And for me, I think one of the most challenging pieces of that friend dynamic is when before they have the baby or before they're pregnant, even they're like, I would never change. would never let that happen. It would never happen. <laughs> Yeah. And I love a good intention. I love a good intention. <laughs> but the reality is typically never that. It's always, you know, and like right up to like the week before they're given birth, even, even if like during the pregnancy, they've been like, no, I'm not going to let this like change my life or, or yeah. you know, I'm going to be the same as always. The, you know, as soon as the baby comes out, I think it is. And I can only imagine the overwhelm of that. And so, there's this need for them then to obviously change their life. But I think it's still their like want to be like, no, but nothing's changing. Nothing's changing. I'm like, but it is changing. Yeah. Like, and, and it should change and it must change. Like that's just the reality of it. But I think it's almost like the more we try to like hang on for dear life to like what it was before, I think that's when both sides can run into trouble. Because I think then like from the non mom side, you're like, well, okay. So you just like, you're not the same person anymore. You don't care anymore. And from the mom's side, they're like, you know, it's hard for, for them to explain just how challenging that new role is. But there's different types of mums, I would say as well. And my husband made a valid point the other day. So he said to me, like, what is with this extremist sort of parenting and worrying about this? And we've got to do this and we've got to do that. And we, he said like, none of that shit was going on when we were growing up. We all turned out fucking awesome as far as I'm concerned like we're a great generation and I actually said it to one of my mum friends and so what I've noticed with all of my mum friends is they definitely fit into two different categories and it will be like quite an extremist sort of mum I would say and not a non-extremist one because that's not I don't quite know I don't even know if extremist is is the right word but they're very mummy you've got very mummy type mummies and then yeah. you've got yeah I'm a mum with kids but my god give me a glass of wine I need a break you yeah. know so there's there's two yeah. different types of mums definitely and I said this to one of my like give me a glass of wine I need a break type of mum friends and she said oh I call those mums the other mums crunchy mummies she said so they're like the granola mummies they're like you know she said <laughs> and like she's laughing about it but she's like she said this is how I look at having my kids she said I love my kids because I know them she said but 
if I didn't know my children's personalities, so, so I, I'm not in love with them. I, I don't know them, you know, I've never met them. And someone just said, you're going to have these kids. She was like, I would probably say, actually, if I could go back, I'd probably take my old life. It was a lot easier. And look, she's an amazing mom. She's a really great yeah. mom. She said, but like, obviously now I know my kids' personalities. It's very different because I can't imagine my life without them. But in the same breath, like she'll say to me, I cannot wait to be able to go out for dinner with you or do this. And she is literally, I can remember she was a new mum. She'd only had the baby for a couple of months. And um, I was going up to London for the night and she was coming to meet me. And it was her first night away from her baby. And I thought that she would be like, like frantic, worried. She was like, fuck yeah. <laughs> My first night's sleep. She was like, I don't, I feel like me again, you know? And, I, and that's the difference, yeah. isn't it? But then, yeah. So that I can relate to. And maybe it's because I feel that if I had a child, that would be the sort of mum I would be. Yeah. But so when someone is like the extreme opposite to that, maybe that's when I feel even more of a disconnect because I don't get it. It's not that there's, no, there's, 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 you can't you can't relate. And that's the thing. And I think like understanding that on both sides, like I feel like it's similar. So I, I kind of liken it to the divorce club, but, but I also think it's interesting because it, it reminds me of like, if I go out to dinner with like all like couple friends and somehow they forget what it's like to be single, right? They just, they've completely forgotten that part of their life, regardless of like, even how long they've been in a couple for, they're just like, they now forget like that it's challenging and that there's like, you know, you have to deal with so much shit and a lot of couples definitely do. There's for sure people that just kind of forget about that. But, but the, the comparison there is, but those people have been single and it's just like, oh, you kind of forget. But I think that on the flip side with the mother thing, you either have or you haven't been a mother, right? There's not really like, you know, and I don't just mean a biological mother. If you had stepchildren or or you fostered or adopted, you know, it all falls under that you've been a mother category. But, you know, I just think that it's so difficult to relate to that. It's so challenging for me to really understand like, you know, and I'm you call in my one girlfriend who has two kids and, you know, a career and she's married. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm so busy and I'm so tired. And, and then I always have to catch myself and be like, well, she's, she, but I don't know how she does it. Like, I really don't know. No, I'm they're like, like superwoman, literally. Yeah, I couldn't imagine then <laughs> adding two kids in. I'm like, what? My, my girlfriend would never say like, hey, you've got nothing to complain about ever. She's always like, oh, are you okay? Like, but, and in my head, I'm just, I just cannot fathom like how you then factor into getting Now, granted I'm single. So like also don't have a partner to even consider that with, but it's like, I just cannot imagine trying to, to, to factor that into my life. And then I was chatting to another friend yesterday who she's married, no kids. They're unsure about whether they want kids or not. And um, her and I were saying, you know, thinking about those, like, you know, when you're getting older and, and if, if, for example, my struggles with getting older was that I didn't have these, you know, life boxes ticked is the, is the, the flip side of that. If you do have those ticks and especially with the kid thing, is it, and this is certainly a question for some of my girlfriends who have kids is the aging thing more like, Oh, my life is, is now I'm losing so much of my own life to my life with my kids and my kids life. And you're like, wow, I like my life has been on pause and and my life hasn't changed significantly in terms of, you know, being able to do new things or I don't know. I'm I'm, it's very much conjecture. So I'm I'm really interested to hear that because I think I think that's the really interesting dynamic. And, And again, you can't kind of know the other side of it like you you either one or the other right you can't kind of you can't do an a b test on it it's either you are you know aging with certain boxes ticked or you're or well you're still aging but you don't have those boxes ticked so the aging is the bit that's consistent across all of us yeah I, i'm not a fan of the aging bit so i'm 37 and things that i struggle with are with aging i don't struggle with not ticking like the life boxes yeah. quote unquote but I, I struggle with the actual fact of aging. So I look at myself and I can see that I'm changing and I hate that I'm that vain, but I am actually that vain. So I can't take that away. I will be the woman that gets the facelift. Like I know I will. And like (laughs) my husband laughs at me because he's like, does it matter? And I'm like, yeah, it does. And he's like, but like you are that age. So why don't you, why don't you want to look that age? And I'm like, because I don't, that's something I deal with. I struggle to deal with, with aging and I struggle to silly things like how I want to dress, 
how I want yeah. to be, the things I want to do. I like going to festivals. I absolutely love going to festivals. Put me in a smelly field for three days and I am living my best life. Does there become a point when you can't do that anymore? When you're that sad person that is just like that mental old lady at the festival? Because like, I'm afraid it's going to be me. But Don't I still, you look at that mental old lady and think, I want to be her. You know, and it's it's everything. I still love tattoos. I still love piercings. And I'll look at women who are in their, let's say, 60s. And they might be like eccentric hippies and that to me is a vibe and it sits comfortably with me, but it doesn't sit comfortably with the majority of society. Yeah. It's a strange one, isn't it? And it's true. And I think the interesting thing as well is, so for me, I guess there's, yeah, there's, there's two things. One is as I'm getting older, it's like, okay, well, where is my life at? Taking that stock that we we're talking about in the life boxes. But the other part is definitely the physical aspect of it. And what that physically looks like on our bodies as we age. And also just, and I think as well in, in my head, and, and this is really like bubbles to the surface for me with my mom is because my mom is now, I mean, she's only 63, but she, um, 62, I think I just aged her. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> um, but she, uh, you know, she, and she's super active and she was saying she runs a lot. And she, the other day she injured herself and she's like, I'm worried that this is what's going to happen. I'm going to injure myself and I'll never, my body just won't be able to recover from it. And I was like, oh my God, that thought, like that, that feeling of like that your body just can't actually regenerate in the way that it used to. And we take it so much for granted when we're younger, right? Yeah. We just fuck up our bodies and do yeah. whatever we want. And it'll and be like, fine. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? I'll just like, n- no idea what a five day hangover is. No, like go out, get absolutely hammered, go to the gym the next day. Like not a problem, you know? And that's like the, the chosen uh, indulgency but you know anything that actually happens to you I'm like oh my god what if yeah like I, I want to take better care of my body and it's not it's not really the reason I gave up alcohol there was a lot of other kind of stuff but it definitely is one of those things now that I think about and I'm like I am glad that I feel like at least I've removed one toxin from my life in that sense you know that I'm like trying to give my body as good a chance as, and this is not me preaching that people should be sober by any means I love mm-hmm. that everyone else drinks but but it's those sorts of things that I'm like, wow, like I'm actually considering that now I'm considering the fact like, you know, I, I don't drink really anymore. I mean, I definitely drink too much coffee, but you know, I've like started taking vitamins that are like for I mean, my health. You've changed. You didn't even drink coffee without like practically shitting yourself. And now look at you <laughs> living your best espresso life. I love it. Come a long way, Lou. You don't know what that story is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah everyone it's has so to read true. the book to get it but it's so true but I literally I think I gave up alcohol and took up coffee but I mean it's a fair switch so Fine. but it's those sorts of things that I, that you know just just the physical ability of my body I guess and the physical health of my body but then the aesthetic part of it as well undoubtedly and I think you mentioned earlier you're like oh I still feel like I'm like you know 18 or young or whatever and I think that's the thing you you still feel that age and you're like wait so why do I have this like wrinkle and I spent my life Lou doing this to my jaw like well if my jaw was just a bit tighter in the (laughs) mirror like what is that about I literally will sit my husband will be driving the car and I'm sat looking in the mirror pulling my face taut just thinking fuck I can't wait for this mini facelift for my 40th like I'm literally counting down to it you're like but that's I mean what a great way of being able to look forward to turning 40 as opposed to the opposite you know I think and that for me was like when did I start caring but I I think it's so easy to not care when when you don't have to live with the effects in your in your face you know and it, especially now we live on zoom and I'm like fuck I thought look at this all day every day yeah well, and it's just, it. and, you know and again like I'm not sitting here really like, oh my face is so terrible it's not but it's just it, you would see it change you you you're physically being faced with your aging and I just you know especially as women and especially with the beauty standards that we have out there and are forced on us by media and social media and it it is difficult and I think it you know it takes a lot of time to check yourself and I think as well the thing for me is probably I didn't really get comfortable or like my body very much until the last four four or five years maybe I was I was kind of overweight in my 20s and it was like always a bit of a struggle and I never really felt that comfortable and I didn't really like my body I was always very much comparing myself and now in fairness and this is the one thing that I do love is I can pretty much say that I'm going to be turning 37 in probably the best physical shape of my life 
And so that feels good. That feels great that I'm like able to. And I think that has been one of those things of like controlling my body and taking care, better care of my body than I had previously to be able, not just able to say that, but to to know that I am actually doing as much as I can to kind of, you know, just soften the aging process a little and kind of not have the effects be so grossly affecting of of my health and my body. That's another big challenge going back to having children. That's another, if I'm being hand on heart honest, that's another big thing that I'm like, oh, that does not sit comfortably with me. And yes, it's incredible that some women are able to grow little humans, but that is just, it just, I I can't explain it. My husband said to me the other day, maybe maybe because of all my issues, uh, because I've got another friend who's got similar issues and she feels quite the same. And, And he said, maybe it's because the hormone imbalance is stopping that maternal and it could be yeah. you know for argument's sake I don't know I don't really care but but the the biggest thing is you know if I'm being hand on heart honest how would I feel about having a baby like strapped to my boob no, that doesn't yeah. comfortably how do I feel about my body potentially getting quite damaged from having a baby no it doesn't sit comfortably and that a lot of women go yeah but you would have brought a life into the world and I'm like yes but I like having a flat stomach like it's <laughs> People will hate me. They will hate me or they'll respect my honesty, one or the other, for saying this. But that is truly how I feel. I would be pissed off that my body had been damaged. And I'm old now, so it definitely would be. Oh, I was going to say, especially now that we are at the ages that we are, I think that it it is much more of a consideration. Again, with anything, anything that you're doing to your body now for us, like later in our 30s, I think there is that like, yeah, the likelihood is it's going to have more of a toll on it. That is just a natural... Yeah. And so the thought of, yeah, the thought of having a baby now and and interestingly, like the pressure becomes more because it's kind of like this, you know, ticking clock if I wanted to have a baby, but then it's also, it makes it harder and it makes the effects probably worse and it, you know, all of those things. And so it's kind of like this compounding of what does my best life look like? And I think that is where like coming back to, to your points earlier, about like you love your life without kids. I think that for me is when I think about like, I, if I met the right person, And I was still physically, or not even still, I don't even know if I am physically able, but if I was physically able to have a child and I wanted to have a a kid with that person, I would be open to it. That's always kind of been my feeling on it. Um, So you want the, this is something that one of my friends says, she's single actually, and she's our age. She says, it's not that I want the kid. I want the family. She said, I want it all or I want none of it. So she said, if I don't have the partner to have the baby with, she was like, I'm not going at it on my own. I've got no interest in that. And I get that. That makes sense. I'm not one of these females. It's like, I will be a mother at all costs. And if I have to do it on my own, I will. I respect them massively because if that is something you want and you decide that you're like, I'm going to go alone, all the power to you. I think it's incredible, but I just have never, I'm similar to you. Like I've never really craved a child or been like that was my life purpose or like desperate to to be a mummy there was never really any of that and, but but like you say absolutely now I'm like it's not the kid that I would want it's the family it is that like family unit it would be you know to have a child with someone who I wanted to procreate with them you know what I mean not just because I wanted to have a baby and so whether that happens who knows but um I don't have that like longing for it. And I think that's helpful because I I can only imagine if I found myself in my position, divorced, single, coming up for 37 and desperately wanted a child, I can only imagine where that leaves you doing your, you know, annual birthday livestock take, you know what I mean? Like, I can't imagine how difficult that is. You know, there's, there is definitely gratitude for that not being like a kind of a life goal of mine and and again it's like similar to you I'm very comfortable with that now and thankfully everybody that knows me would never even dare ask you know oh but do you not want kids or don't you wish you could meet someone and like you know they just they are aware that like it's just not a priority in that sense and so that definitely helps but again like you were saying you know it sounds like all your sort of surrounding family are kind of on board with that and how lucky we are that that's how where we find ourselves right rather right. than having people and I, like you're I mean I used to have people say this to me they're like oh you'll change your mind or but how patronizing is it like even now at 37 years of age when I've literally been borderline considering going down the route of hysterectomy because of my issues even now I still have people saying but you'll change your mind. I'm 30 fucking seven. I don't see my mind changing, guys. You have to stop saying that to me. If anyone says to me, 
anything about children. Like if you just say to someone, well, I'm barren. Like, yeah, yeah, oh, I know. But like, but fuck, imagine like, actually I was heartbroken about this. Yeah. Imagine yeah. I had that. And I, I swear like on, on my life, I am not, I am not remotely heartbroken about it. It is fine. Cause I hate it as well when people go, oh, but you probably are deep down. And you're... I know how I feel. <laughs> Like, it's really annoying. Don't worry, tell me. I'm like, I know what I'm feeling. This is how I'm feeling. But for the women who are struggling and would love a child to keep saying to someone, when are you going to have kids? Oh, it will happen for you. It's none of your business. You know, yeah. that's how I feel about it. A hundred percent. And it's interesting because in the same way, I think that like asking someone about that or commenting on someone's weight or, you know, things that you just don't know the story of, right? You have no clue about whether it is medical, whether it is a choice. The kid thing, especially, I, you know, I have friends who have had fertility issues who desperately want to have children. And, you know, you're sitting through going to events or going to family functions and they're like, oh, so, you know what, when is it going to happen for you? And do we hear the pitter patter of tiny feet? And you're like, you just don't get to ask that like it's so or on the flip side as well if it's people like us who were like you're not really that bothered about it I mean for them that's then just so confronting because they just don't understand why on earth you wouldn't want to have a kid they're like what well what are you going to do with your life you're like everything else everything else literally everything but the kid thing you make and this goes back full circle to like the start of the conversation almost but you make your life and your life choices in conjunction to your current situation and your circumstances and just because that doesn't fit in with society's idea that doesn't mean that the path you're doing is the wrong path yeah it's right for you and I love having kids for everyone else you do that if you want kids you do that and I will entertain your child and I will help you out with your child as much as I can but that's not what my life looks like and that doesn't make my life wrong yeah well and, and it comes back to like we're saying if it's not the boxes of like married kids career you know house is it instead happiness fulfillment alignment right like are you being aligned with like how you actually want are you designing your life for you or are you living your life for society I guess that's really what it comes down to and I think that when you design your life for you that is very uncomfortable for a lot of people who have been swept along with society and for some of them are very happy there for Mm -hmm. others are like shit how did this happen I follow this Instagram account called drunk and overseas now I'm not drunk anymore but I'm definitely an aunt overseas but it's really interesting it's such an interesting account because it's obviously run by this like single uh single woman and she you know talks a lot about being uh, consciously childless like that is a decision that she has made and what is fascinating about the case it's not it's not just like mum bashing although a lot of people uh, uh, there's definitely mums that find it that sort of way and and it's not the intention but a lot of the content that she puts on her stories is actually parents either dming her or commenting on her posts saying i love my kids but fuck i wish i didn't have them i wish someone had honestly told me what having kids would be like i wish someone had really like sat me down and explained how every single facet of my life would not only change, but would no longer be my own, you know? And again, it's different for everyone. And there's definitely those parents who can like, to some degree, find a balance between their life and their kid's life. But, you know, it's, it's just fascinating. I think how many of those, you know, like you were saying, like, you, you know, all your, a lot of your friends have kids, but not necessarily are all, are all living their happiest and best lives. And I mean, that can be the same for anyone, right? You can be single and still not living your happiest and best life. That can definitely be true. But it is that feeling of like, at least to some degree, the assumption privileged assumption that I have is like, if I changed my mind and I wanted to have kids, even if I couldn't have them naturally, I could somehow probably fulfill that. But the flip of that is if you have kids, you can't undo that. You know what I mean? Like that is not a return policy on kids. No. Um, and so, you know, and I mean, even on dogs, there kind of is, you know, like if I wanted yeah, to take it to the pound, exactly. I, mean, so I would thank gonna... you for it, but you know, you could take it to the pound. <laughs> But, you know, and again, I think that's one of those things where it's like, if you really make that conscious choice, rather than just being like, okay, well, we got married. So I guess now we should have kids. And then, you know, 10 years down the line, you're like, wow, this was not really the life that I actually wanted for myself. Answer me this. How often, hand on heart, because I can tell you straight, it never happens to me ever. How often, hand on heart, could you say that you would sit there 
and think, oh, I wish I had someone's life who's got a child because it never happens for me. And then I wonder how often the people with children think, I wish I had their life without the child. That would happen a lot more often, I think. I would think, I would hazard a guess. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, yeah, you're right. I don't think I've ever sat there like, oh, wow, look, that chaotic family holiday at like some kids resort. I'm like, that looks delightful. (laughs) I'm like notorious back in the years of uh, Facebook that, you know, you'd put your statuses up and (laughs) I... I was notorious because obviously I was traveling a lot between Australia and the UK. It was a very long fucking flight. And I used to do it like quite regularly. And if a kid even so much as breathed, I would be like on a full rant, like I'm on this fucking flight with these kids and they're making a noise. And And my husband is the same. Like we tend to fly business class a lot and there are kids in business class and they're running riots up and down the aisles. And he is like, it is thousands of pounds for a seat so I can sleep, like control your child. And he hates it and I get it I hate it too even my best friend who's got kids if like we're anywhere and a kid starts like making a noise like she's she's my like very realist mum friend she is just like oh my god someone shut that fucking kid up even if it's her kid making a noise she's like why is it making a noise and like I loved her like we we caught up the other day on FaceTime and her oldest um it's my godson her her oldest boy was I don't know what he was doing try, basically just chattering and and she was just like Shh, like no and she like literally gave him like a big bag of chips and she was like you go over there and you eat those even if you feel sick that's fine you just eat them yeah. until you feel sick and like bless him he was so happy and then she like put the camera on him and she was like mother of the year me and I was like yeah but you just want to catch up with your friend so you're doing that. He's happy. But it's the same way when people are like, oh, I can't believe that they've given the kid an iPad. Well, like the kid's being quiet. So don't worry about it. The kid's going to grow up playing on computers and iPads yeah. and stuff. And yeah, I do think kids should go outdoors more and all of that stuff. But whatever works. Well, and it's interesting because for a while, when I actually when I was married, my uh, or when I was in that relationship with my ex-husband, you know, he and I used to purposefully choose to go to like adults only resorts and we you know and I'm not talking about like sex resorts although that sounds great maybe but, yeah it could be fun <laughs> but you know adults are like no kids like yeah, that yeah. was just, that was our preference and I've always said like if there was an airline that you could pay extra for and there were like no kids on the flight I know this and my husband to be on it <laughs> and I'm sorry to everyone that has kids like I'm sorry but- I'm not sorry <laughs> I'm not like it's a personal choice. My heart goes out to little ones on flights and the cabin pressure and the baby's crying. And it's it's I really genuinely do feel sorry for the parent because it's not fun for them. Like it's exactly. I see my best friend do that journey from Australia and she's like, I can't cope with this, like the anxiety. But it kind of really sucks for the people that chose not to have the children. Yeah. So it's a really yeah. hard one. No, I agree. And and like I say, I I you know, I feel awful for them having to deal with that. I can't imagine. I've always and and I think that's always been my feeling as I was like god if I had a kid I just I wouldn't travel (laughs) I'd be like five years of no travel I was like because I just couldn't inflict that on other like I would feel so bad and then I mean I know that's extreme and I'm pretty sure if I have a kid I would definitely be traveling in five years but it's one of those things where your mentality changes though when you've got the child because exactly when it's your baby that's crying so when everyone I don't know like maybe some women don't mind lots of kids crying and screaming but as a general rule people don't enjoy it they don't enjoy listening to other people's children but then when it's your child that's doing it you kind of think well it is what it is so it's a very different because it's your child and you love it so it's and also you're probably doing your absolute best to like calm it down sure you're not in which case you're a terrible parent but like you know the likelihood, is, the likelihood is I'm guessing that you're like trying and you know I can only imagine also how fucking stressful that is so mm. and again just like I can't I don't know why I mean it just sounds awful so I get it but yeah like for me it's it's again one of those things where if I like you say if it's been a choice then I would like to also choose to as far as possible in certain circumstances be able to like fully remove myself from that but again then it's like well you're a terrible person like why would you not want to like because you're not a woman you don't love children right? you're not a like, woman. how could you not yeah do you not have a maternal bone in your body no I don't think that there is a maternal not. <laughs> it, it just it, it winds me up I really okay. and like I say for most people it's now that know me I think there's there's definitely a sense of like you know everyone kind of knows where I'm at with it but but I'm also like why should I have had to have gone through and and so publicly spoken about things that I have for people to kind of get that 
Like, why can we not just respect women to the point where like, you just don't ask about it. Like we were saying, like, you know, if there are issues and they're not able to have a baby or whatever it might be, they've lost baby. Like you just don't know. And instead we're just going to like make women think that like, that's what they were put on this earth to do. And if you don't do it, somehow your value is less. And I think that also goes back to the aging thing of like, as a woman getting older, if you haven't procreated and you haven't, you know, added to life on this earth in that way, then what are you doing? What, what, you know, where is your value? I love seeing older women, like fifties, sixties, like crushing careers, like whether it is like CEOs of businesses or whether it's actresses or whatever. I'm like, fuck yes. Like this is, that is like my goals, right? Like that is what I want to be, you know, whether it's women in media, especially, cause I can only imagine the, I can only imagine the kind of scrutiny that they're under, but like that for me is like, that's, I look at that and be far more inspired than look at a picture of like, you know, a family on, on holiday and be like, oh, I wish I had that. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm the same as you there. Like I would much rather, and the, the harsh reality is again, one of my friends, she chose to have a child. She's good at her job. She's got, she's got a decent job. She took time off for maternity leave because obviously she's having a baby. She has definitely without a shadow of a doubt been penalized for it. And yeah. we were, you know, I won't go too much into it, but, but yeah, it's been, it's been hard for her. And she says it's because I had a child and I shouldn't have been penalized, but I actually just kind of have, uh, they've unknowingly penalized her, I think yeah. is, is the the tough point. Yeah. And, and, I, and it's difficult because again, and I have a similar, I have a friend who two kids now and back at work and also, you know, during COVID and, and, you know, homeschooling and all that nonsense. And so is working part-time. Well, I was trying to do like full-time hours in part-time days, which, yeah. you know, again, and you're still being a mother. Like it just, it just. Superwoman. Defies, I like superwoman. Yeah, defies like defies belief. And so, but, you know, working part-time and there is something that like, that is just, again, unfairly, but in some ways understandably so that then there is this dis- disparate like level of almost like the, if you're there less you're seen less right there's this sense of like well you're obviously you're obviously busy with other things which is not strictly true but you know when we talk about women having all and yes we can and the all thing can mean different things to different people but there is ultimately it with especially with the baby thing there's no getting around that right you can't have your husband have it you can't you know it you are unless you're adopting or you're you know using a surrogate you're physically going to be needing to kind of be there so Mm -hmm. it's one of those things where again you take the time off that you need to take or even if you have adopted you know you'd still obviously I would imagine there's you know, I think there's still laws around maternal maternity leave for that. And so you take the time to do that. But when you go back, there is always going to be that potential for you've been overlooked for a promotion or you've missed out on certain projects or, you know, or, or like my friend who's working part time, like has to kind of pick and choose which parts of her job she wanted to retain. And then other pieces kind of got taken. And you're like, wow, that's like, that's such that's, a serious choice have to make and then are you choosing based on like what you enjoy doing or are you trying to choose strategically based on what you think is going to get you more notice and, and potential for promotion like that is just a whole lot of of considerations that mostly men don't ever have to make and I think especially as we get older as well then it's like how do you make sure that you're still relevant and that you know yes you then have the added advantage of like years of expertise hopefully but there's still just so much stacked against us. And I think that's the interesting thing as well as from my perspective, like partly why I think as well, there's a feeling for me of wanting to like have my career in marketing, but also have my writing is I feel like then the writing kind of really can't be taken away from me. Like that is very much on my own terms. Um, and it's not based on anyone's sense of value or worth yeah. of that apart from my own. I think that for a lot of women our age, you really should be, I think, allowed to be confident and comfortable enough in yourself to design what your life should look like without having to make excuses. Yeah. Maybe that's yeah. the word I'm looking for. And my husband said, well, we've got a family. And I said, well, what are you on about? We haven't really. And he's like, well, we have, we've got three dogs and us. He said, why is that not a family? He was like, yeah. that's a family. And he's right. That is a family. And yeah. he, he is right. Literally, I'm fulfilled. That is my family. But you try and say that to someone else and they don't. They go, I'm not really. They're like, well, like- not really because it's dogs. And I've only got one friend who's like, oh, yeah, dogs are like more hard work than kids, particularly my bloody three. 
I'm, you know, but but most of them are like, yeah, but you've got a dog, you haven't got a baby. And and the most hurtful thing someone said to me was, yeah, but you you don't understand what it's like to try and juggle my life. No, you're right, I don't. But you don't know what it's like to juggle mine either. So things, you know, yeah. and it's and you never and you never will know. You'll never know someone else's life. And I think that's trying to make comparisons in that way is not helpful to really anyone. But I agree. When I actually got married, the one thing that you know a relationship didn't change. I mean, I'm laughing in, in my head because I'm like, well, it did six weeks later when, you know, it really, <laughs> yeah. but, but the actual marriage didn't, I don't think that was not the thing that changed it. But actually the one thing I always felt, said afterwards when people were like, so do you feel any different? I was like, yeah, I actually feel like we're a family. Like that was for him and I, just him and I, we didn't have a dog, nothing, mm. just him and I. And I was like, I feel like we are a family. And it was a really, I hadn't expected it. And it was just this strange I mean it was very short-lived but it was this strange like I do know what you mean I loved it I really loved it and and I think that probably also doubled down on my feelings of like oh I don't know that I necessarily have to have kids and he and I like I said were I think we probably presumed that at some point we probably would end up doing it but it was like not really on our like priority list or like certainly not at that time and yet still like as soon as we were married I was like oh I feel like we're a family already and so that was kind of like oh maybe the kids thing isn't that important and to some, you know, and this is, we're not saying here, I don't think it's in, in any way saying that everyone that has kids is unhappy, but I think no, not at all. Some people are really happy. It's all yeah. they ever wanted. And it's just such a change, right? It's that evolution of your life. And, and I think giving up parts that you maybe weren't prepared to or knew that you had to and I think yeah for me as well to some degree almost like the reason I got a dog was because I needed to be able to kind of prove to myself at least that I was able to commit to something and take care of something that wouldn't die because all the plants that I've ever owned have always died so I don't have plants (laughs) so I'm like wow I'm like just a terrible human being but again like I love that that is like a a, a sense of I'm, I'm not doing well at life if I can't have kids or you know I don't have kids and I can't keep plants and like I need to be keeping something alive other than myself and I'm like is it not just enough that I'm keeping myself alive like I think that's quite impressive like after 37 years especially some of the years I've had I'm like (laughs) I'm actually I'm actually that's just that should just be the one and only tick that is required on that like stock take of life the tick on the stock take of life that you're looking for is from society not from yourself because you know within yourself actually that you're doing incredibly well. And a million people would look at your life, Lou, like you've got a successful career in marketing. You've got a published bloody book. You live on the other side of the world in Vancouver. You've got a glorious life. I'm not saying that every day is perfect or every day is easy, but you know what? If you take stock of your life, my God, you're winning. You are definitely winning. But yet there's still that little thing because society hasn't gone, hey, do you know what, Lou? You are winning because you are not married with a kid and a mortgage. Yeah. you're suddenly like oh shit well maybe all of these achievements yeah we'll put them in a box they don't really mean anything because you know what I'm not married with a kid what the fuck like yeah. that insanity yeah. at its finest and it's and it, it is like actual work for me to really keep my head in that space of like no like we I have done so much and I am so happy and I feel so aligned and I feel so at peace and like those are the things right like those are the pieces that I need to celebrate and be aware of as I'm you know, going into my next year, but yeah, you're right. Like it's, that is not, those are not the traditional boxes. And so it's like, well, where, how, where do they fall on the value scale? And I think that the reality is doing it against society's value is never going to be useful for any, for actually for anybody, because even as a parent, I imagine you probably are then like, but I'm, but I could be a better mom. I could be, you know, it like, it's just, it's just nonstop. The, what's, what's the saying comparisons, the, um, thief of joy or something like yes that. yeah and it's true and it is true women like you so these are the women I like to surround myself with childless middle-aged unfortunately because we are forget <gasps> No, but we are. I'm sorry. It's depressing, but it is what it is. You know, we're childless. We're of a certain age, but I think we're really fabulous within our own right. And we can sit down and put the world to rights and have these really deep conversations that I generally can't have with my friends who've got little ones because they're so either distracted, tired, or I guess talking about things that I can't necessarily relate to because we're barking up different trees now. And I, 
I I feel that disconnect with with people. So when I do find women like minded women who are like me, I just think, yes, like this is great. Yeah. They are few and far between, but <laughs> well, and also it comes back to from the mummy club, right? In the same way that you want to surround yourself, I would imagine as a mum with like minded oh, people in similar situations. Exactly, you're like actually the same is true of of yeah, child free. You know, people that are doing different things in in their lives, and and, and that is exactly the same as me I'm like there's something so it, it makes me feel much more in aligned with myself but it's true I feel like you know having those conversations as well of like different perspectives and different I like I love the different perspectives which is why I really for this piece I was like I really want to talk to like all the full range of like where people are in their life and kind of get get a, a taste of it and so I think that that is the other part of of me is especially as and I've gotten older but when I was younger I was very close-minded and I was very like judgmental and mostly through fear and shame that's always where that comes from but but yeah very judgmental very much like if it was if it didn't look like me and look like my life then it wasn't right and now I'm just like oh I'm so fascinated by other people's lives and I think it's because just from a general sense of curiosity and from like what can I learn from that but I think it's also because it's a really lovely reminder to me, like how much I love my life and how much I have designed it to be exactly the way that I wanted it to be. And so you can appreciate and empathize to a certain degree, at least with other life choices. But there's also something about it kind of like really doubling down and like, but my God, my life suits me so well. My favorite saying is I love that for you. Yes. So I love 2.4 kids and a white picket fence, not necessarily for you, but you know, for, for said friends, said people yeah. out there. I yeah. don't love that for me. That for me makes me feel suffocated. It makes yeah. me feel downtrodden. It, ma- it makes me feel quite miserable. That That's like an anxiety inducing feeling inside of me. And it's not because I've got a fear of commitment. You know, I've have multiple pets I've got a mortgage I've got a husband you know it but it's that fear of I guess not having complete control over my daily life and that is what being a mum is because your little one then is the one that controls your yeah. life and it is the sad thing that I'm getting from this whole conversation and I wonder and I'll be interested now when I read your piece to see is if the shared common theme is that people are actually okay with their situation, but they're worried that everyone else isn't okay with their situation because that's how it's kind of feeling. Yeah. Like I look at your life and to me, you're just fucking fabulous and you're living your best life. But to you, you're worried that then the next person doesn't think that your life is fucking fabulous. Yeah. Even though yeah, I think so. And, and that's the interesting thing because again, I mean, for a while I wasn't, I wasn't internally I wasn't feel I wasn't comfortable with it I felt very much at odds with where I wanted to be where I felt I should be where I thought I would be and now that's not the that's not the case like I feel like I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be I'm where I want to be you know there's and there's always things that you you want to you know change and make better but for the most part like I'm exactly you know on the right path but it is it's still that like okay, but do other people look at me and think, you know, that's kind of like pity or like, oh, but she doesn't have kids or like, oh, I bet she miss, misses out on that. You know what I mean? Like, I bet she just wish she had someone. And I think, again, the comparison quote is is exactly right. It is the thief of joy. And, and I try as much as I, I can not to do that. But yeah, my my interest is really, if you have those things and what, what are there still, there must still be things that you are concerned by. And I guess that's also like with that reframing that I had to do of where I thought like, oh, well, I always wanted there to be more to my life, but I was like, but it felt like it was going to be like, be a wife, be a mom. And I was like, okay, well, if that's not what we're doing, then what are we doing? What, what, what's my purpose? What am I you know, here to do? And that is a difficult question to answer, but I also think part of it is, and I don't mean this in like, fuck everything else, but I mean, like it is to live your life, right? It is to have that human experience. It is like, for me, it always comes down to like, it is to make connections. It is to better yourself others and the the you know the world at large as as much as we we possibly can that's what you do with your writing well I mean and you know that's what I kind of um job tempting to do is at least reach others right is like have some form of connection there and have some of form of like relatable yeah safe spaces for people to be like oh yeah wow I feel like that too like that's also my mess you know and so yeah that's that's kind of where I feel that that's and I and alignment in that sense as well has also become more important to me as I've gotten older and like okay yeah like I don't just want to like piss my life away and waste my weekends being hungover and 
be working on a job that I don't care about, but at least it pays me a lot of money. Like I need to be actually doing something that is feels worthwhile. Satisfying. You want life satisfaction, whatever that might look like for you. Exactly. And that's, you need to shake those societal constraints off because actually I don't think anyone can ever find complete life satisfaction if they are still being influenced by the societal constraints. And I think that the biggest life hack is probably shake that shit off and then you will be genuinely happy within your zone. Yep, I would agree. I would agree. Well, I love you and leave you gorgeous. I hope that I helped give you some- no, it was super yes no super helpful super interesting um yeah i appreciate a bit of a helpful. weird perspective no no it's perfect that, and that's it like are there so many different permutations of how people live their life and so it's just interesting to get those perspectives so anywho i've got to go and pick up an asda click and clack because that is how oh. glamorous my fucking life is fucking i fucking miss asda though let me tell you um all right well enjoy your asda click and collects and uh, awesome. i will see you later i'll speak to you soon so lovely you. catching up with you thank you bye, yes. bye. Okay, bye. Thanks for tuning in to episode one of season two today, guys. It's really great to be back and thank you for joining me. If you are enjoying the show, Apple have changed things up a bit since the last season and subscription and automatic downloads is no longer a thing on Apple. So if you do want to be first in line for the shows, then make sure you hop onto Apple and click follow. Whilst you're there, if you get a chance to leave me a quick review, that would be great. Obviously, that helps the algorithm. It helps the shows reach more people. Thank you also to all of you who do share my content, share my shows and your socials with your friends. Word of mouth has definitely helped the growth of the show for season one. And I hope it's the same for season two. If you guys want to connect with Lou or get any more info on Lou's blog or book, then hop on over to the Grown Up Hustle podcast on Instagram, where you will find Lou tagged on the grid under Lou Writes Life. Whilst you're there, don't forget to give us a follow just so you can stay up to date with upcoming show topics and events. I hope you all have an absolutely awesome week as always. Great to be back and thank you again and I will catch you all next week.